Greetings and welcome to the CCOF Foundation Holistic and Organic Livestock Management 101 webinar. We are happy to hear you, have you here with us today. We have two wonderful presenters who will give an overview of the basics and synergies of organic and holistic livestock management for cattle operations. Before we begin, I wanted to give a warm thank you to our sponsor, Arbico Organics. Since 1979, Arbico Organics has been providing biological pest control solutions for equine, cattle, and other livestock operations. They're expanded to a wide range of beneficial and predatory insects and organisms, soil fertility, natural insecticides, and disease control solutions for farmers, growers, and gardeners of all sizes. If you're having difficulties connecting to the webinar, if you can't hear, can't see, please call our office for support at 831-423-2263. Press zero for the operator and someone will help you connect to the webinar. My name is Megan Donovan and I will be your host today. I'm a program specialist at the CCOF Foundation the CCOS Foundation advances organic agriculture for a healthy world through education and hardship grants, technical assistance, and consumer education. We are proud to build upon more than 40 years of CCOS commitment to growing organic. We are very excited to have Kelsey Maven from CCOS and Joe Morris from TO Cattle Company here with us today. I will introduce each speaker in more depth prior to their presentation. We wanted to thank Holistic Management International, also known as HMI, for partnering with us on this webinar. Kathy Harris, Program Director at HMI, will be online with us today as well. Uh, she won't be presenting, but will be on hand to answer questions about holistic management. Before we get started with our first speaker, I wanted to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's web event. We're looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts. The viewer window on the left, which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on the screen, and the control panel on the right. Within the control panel is how you can participate in today's event, so let's take a look at that. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close your control panel from the view menu. You can also set the control panel not to auto-hide um, when it's inactive if you prefer to always have it open. The audio pane provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar by microphone and speakers. If you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting phone call and the dial-in information will be displayed. During the presentation, you have the ability to send questions to our webinar staff through the questions pane. Simply type in your question and click send. After each speaker, we'll stop for questions from the audience. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. As a final reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive an email with a link to view the recording of today's event, along with a PDF of the PowerPoint slides. So we'd like you to test out the questions pane, um, write in, let us know where you're calling from today and whether you're most familiar with organic or holistic management practices. Um, and we have a lot of people in the audience today, which is great, um, and we're going to try to respond to as many questions and comments as possible, um, but we wanted to apologize in advance if we aren't able to get to your specific question and encourage you to follow up after the webinar. So it's my pleasure to introduce Kelsey Megan from CCOS, who will present an overview of organic livestock certification. Kelsey Megan works as a senior farm certification specialist in CCOS livestock department. Prior to working at CCOS, Kelsey worked as the Livestock Manager at Massa Organics in Glen County, California. She also directed the Agritourism Program and managed livestock in the orchard pasture system at Chafin Family Orchards in Oroville, California. Kelsey has experience in raising and managing 
a wide range of animals, including sheep, laying hens, pigs, goats, and cattle. So Kelsey, thank you much for being with us here today, and I will turn the presentation over to you. Thanks. Um, we have about 15 minutes here in this webinar to talk about the basics of organic livestock certification. Um, I recognize our group today has probably has a mixed knowledge of organic, everything from producers thinking about getting certified through um, already existing organic producers, as well as probably some certification staff. So I just wanted to give the heads up that this presentation is going to be fairly introductory level at organic livestock certification, and that we're probably going to be primarily addressing this from the perspective of beef operations. Of course, this information is applicable to all livestock, but but because we're talking about holistic management and because Joe is operating a cattle operation, we're kind of going to be looking at it primarily through that lens. Um, today we'll cover what is organic, some of the steps and requirements to get certified, and then hopefully have time for questions at the end. First off, what is organic? Um, organic is primarily a production management system that's based on minimal use of off-farm inputs and seek out practices that restore and enhance the ecological harmony of your operation. It's a program that's regulated by the USDA. It operates as the National Organic Program, which is um, a program within the Agriculture Marketing Service of the USDA. And then certifiers such as CCOS are accredited by the NOP, and they, their task is to monitor and enforce those regulations. So sort of just a quick look at what the certification process looks like to get certified. Um, it begins when a farm or ranch turns in a application to be reviewed by a certifier. This is essentially the organic system plan, which we'll talk about more in depth in a minute. Once that application re is reviewed by the certifier, it's followed up by an inspection at your operation. The inspection report is then reviewed by the certifier. And if there's no issues, they issue certificates for organic certification. After that, in order to maintain your annual um, certification, you have an inspection approximately once a year and do a renewal process once a year as well. The organic system plan itself is a description of your operations practices in order to show that the organic standards are being met. It's an agreed-upon con contract between you as the applicant and your, the certifier you've chosen. It only needs to be updated if and when your practices change, and so it can be considered a living document. And the verification process, essentially, is that the certifier will verify that your OSP describes practices that are compliant to the regulations for organic, and then the inspection process verifies that what you're doing at your ranch is functioning as you described it in your organic system plan. So next we're going to run through um, some of the requirements for organic and how those apply to operations. First is, is the requirements for the land. You're going to want to have no prohibited substances applied within three years prior to either harvest of organic crops or grazing of organic livestock. You want to have parcels with distinct defined boundaries that you can recognize clearly what you have management of versus what your neighbors have management of. In terms of land, you can elect either to certify just your acreage without certifying your livestock. So in essence, you could choose to get organic certification for acreage without certifying those animals that are grazing on the land. And this allows operations potentially to graze for other organic livestock operations, or you could elect to certify both your land and your livestock. And if you do choose to certify your livestock as organic, all lands that they are located on and, and get feed from must be certified. So something to keep in mind is that any land that you lease or any land that you are grazing that is either from BLM or Bureau of Reclamation, we often certify parcels from those agencies, and it's, it's a fairly easy process to get leased or government land certified. Um, so all acreage that your cattle graze on needs to be certified if you're going to bring your livestock into certification. Moving on to seeds, the um, requirement is that if you're planting pastures or cropland, 
then the seeds must be organic. If you can't find a commercially available seed variety that you need, you can elect to plant non-organic seed. You just have to have it documented that you verify that that seed is both untreated and it's not genetically modified. Um, keep in mind that this doesn't apply if you've got large tracts of rangeland or pasture where no seeding is occurring. This regulation only applies to those people that are, that are reseeding pastures. And then some other final points for land use is it's important in organic to identify potential risk areas and have some control measures in place, things like avoiding pesticide drift and, and knowing if you have any potentially neighboring land use issues such as runoff or things like that. Treated lumber is prohibited once you're certified. So if you have fence replacements or barns or corrals, things like that, you're gonna wanna choose untreated lumber once you're certified. Existing treated wood at the time of certification can stay. And then finally, if you're growing hay and harvesting crops or hay or silage or anything like that, you need to be able to demonstrate that any shared equipment that's used on both organic and non-organic crops has been cleaned prior to use in organic. So if you have a custom hay harvester come in, you just want to get a letter from them showing that they cleaned their equipment prior to coming to your operation. Moving into the livestock side of organic certification, um, livestock need to be managed organically from the last third of gestation, with some small exceptions for poultry coming from hatcheries or dairy animals that are strictly being used to produce organic milk but are not for organic slaughter. For a beef operation that is wanting to sell organic animals for organic slaughter, you need to manage those calves as organic from the last third of their gestation onward. So something that's useful for a lot of beef operations to know is that you can maintain a breeder herd that is non-organic, so long as those cows are managed organically, at least from the last third of gestation through weaning. So if you currently have a cow-calf operation, you could certify your land and get livestock certification, keeping your current non-organic cows and just managing those cows from the last third as organic animals and keeping them on organic pasture and their calves will be eligible for sale as organic slaughter animals. So you do not need to bring every animal you own under organic certification. You can maintain organic animals and non-organic animals on the same operation. For livestock feed, all feed and pastures provided for organic animals must be organic with some limited exceptions for additives and supplements which allows for um, essentially vitamin and mineral supplements that, that aren't required to fall under the organic regulations. Um, those substances still need to be approved by your certifier though. For all operations raising ruminants, cattle, sheep, goats, they must receive a minimum of 30% of their dry matter demand from the pasture during the growing season. Growing season can vary a lot depending on where you're located, but it needs to be a minimum of 120 days that those animals get at least 30% of their demand from pasture. If you have a primarily grass-based operation, this should be no trouble. Um, we have lots of salt and mineral mixes that are allowed under these feed requirements. Protein tubs can be a little bit more difficult sometimes. It's just important to check with your certifier before you use stuff, and we can tell you what's allowed and what's, what might not be allowed. In terms of healthcare treatments, Organic essentially seeks to maximize preventative healthcare practices. This can be everything from choosing appropriate breeds or species for your specific conditions where you're at and providing things like quality nutrition and appropriate housing. Vaccine use is not only allowed but encouraged in organic. It's a, one of the primary tools for preventative health to prevent disease before it can occur. So it's, it's encouraged. If your preventative practices don't work, there are select medications allowed. Um, some examples are things like alcohol, aspirin, um, lidocaine, copper sulfate, things like that. It's essentially just important to check with your certifier before you use things. How you can find out if an input is allowed, if it has already an OMRI or WSDA listing and a logo on it, that it means that it's allowed for use in organic production. If not, you can request to use materials on either your li livestock or your land. Um, by contacting your certifier and giving them the product name and manufacturer as well as an ingredient list. Here at CCOS, we have all OMRI and WSDA listed materials as well as every material we've ever 
reviewed for any CCUS clients that are all included in a database that you can search. It essentially provides thousands of materials that have already gone through that review process and you can know right away whether it's approved or not approved for use in organic production. The takeaway is, is to really always check with your certifier and get approval prior to use. If there's materials you think you may want to use in the future, we encourage people just to check ahead of time and then you can have it listed as approved in case it comes up in an emergency situation that you want to use something. Moving on to living condition requirements for organic. These requirements are largely applicable for dairy and poultry and swine production. If you have a pasture-based beef operation, you should have no trouble with living conditions and you're largely already compliant with how your animals live today before you're certified. Um, the requirements are things like outdoor access for all animals and pasture access for ruminant animals, the basics of providing shade and appropriate shelter for the species, and things like fresh air and sunlight and so access to soil are required at all times unless there's a justified reason for confining your animals, and then the use of clean and dry bedding when necessary. Um, again, if you're a pasture-based beast operation, this should be little trouble for you to comply with. Pasture as well um, is something that's fairly easy to comply with if you're already pasture-based. Um, if you've already established and identified your holistic context, if you're doing a planned grazing form, you will meet these requirements for organic. Organic requires that ruminant producers demonstrate a functioning management plan for their pasture that allows for adequate feed during your growing season and minimizing the spread of disease while protecting the soil and water quality for your area. So if you've got a grazing plan through holistic management, that will meet the requirements for this for organic. Next is record keeping. Record keeping is an important com component of organic because it demonstrates your ability to comply with the regulations. Your record keeping can be unique to your operation and it can vary from operation to operation, so long as you have the ability to show that you're meeting the organic standards. Some common um, records that are provided by operations are herd lists, identifying all your animals, um, maintaining records of the feed and medication you both purchase and when you use it on livestock, um, keeping track of your organic sales, and making sure you keep all those records for at least five years and have them available for your inspector at time of inspection. The annual inspection process is when an inspector comes to your operation, they'll review your OSP and then take a tour of your farm or your ranch, observing that your practices are aligned with what you stated you're doing in your OSP, and then they'll check out whatever records are pertinent to organic production. A quick overview of what does organic cost. These are some examples of CCOS certification fees. That includes that initial application when you turn in your OSP. That's a one-time fee of $325. Then you have an annual inspection cost. A typical farm inspection often ranges from $250 to $750, depending on the size and how ready your records are to be reviewed. And then there's an annual certification cost, which is based on your gross production value. Um, there's some examples here. If you produce between $100,000 and $200,000 a year, an organic product, it would be an annual fee of 725. Keep in mind that any feed or hay or seed that you're purchasing from off farm can be deducted from your organic production value, which can help lower your certification fee. There's also a cost share program that's funded through the farm bill that can help offset up to 75% of your certification costs annually. That's a separate thing that you can apply for annually and get reimbursed for those costs. So sort of in closing of the organic portion of the webinar, um, how does holistic management and organic combine and where can those, those two production systems align? Essentially both systems are gonna work to increase the ecological functions of your operation and improve overall soil health. Um, the records that you maintain for holistic plan grazing in your chart can be used to verify aspects of organic compliance. So records can overlap and be used in both systems. And at the end of the day, planning and being Organized and keeping keeping up with good records are, are really critical in both management systems for knowing what's happening on your operations. In terms of current CCOS certified operations using holistic management, we have we have a little bit of everything. We have some ranches that have elected to certify just their land as organic. This allows for 
custom grazing of livestock from other organic operations and can assist in maximizing the potential for positive animal impact on pasture. So some of these operations are bringing in extra cattle at times of the year where they have a lot of feed, really maximizing the impact on the land at those times, and then moving those organic animals back to the operation that owns them when they don't need that extra animal impact. Um, Joe, who's going to talk next, has, is choosing a system where he currently has his land certified. Um, some other operations, like Sonoma Mountain Institute, has conservation land that they graze non-organic animals on. The Jefferson Hub for Holistic Management in Northern California has their land certified and brings on organic animals in addition to their non-organic animals. So there's lots of ways that these systems can work together. We also have many certified with both their land and their livestock under organic certification. So we have a diversity of species covered, everything from poultry to sheep and goats to cattle. Um, both organic and holistic management can work well for diverse operations and diverse types of species. And organic, at the end of the day, can help improve the income through premiums you receive for those organic livestock if you elect to certify your livestock as well as your land. So I think we have a little bit of extra time maybe for questions. And if there's none, we can maybe let Joe take the stage from here. Yes, um, thanks, Kelsey. That was a really good overview of the organic requirements for livestock operations. So thank you very much. And we do have time for questions, so please send them in if you have any questions for Kelsey. Um, and we'd also like to hear from you, too. Um, we have a lot of people in the audience, as Kelsey mentioned. Some of you currently use holistic management practices. Others are more familiar with organic. So if you'd like to share kind of how you manage your pasture or anything else about your operation, please feel free to write in. Um, we don't want this to be just a one-way conversation. We want to hear from you as well. Um, so just to loop back on the questions that we asked earlier um, of the audience, we have people calling in from Olympia and Washington, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Santa Cruz, California, um, people from Colorado, Michigan, Idaho, and New Mexico. So that's people in the audience from all over the U.S. And um, people wrote in to say that there's a basic knowledge of both organic and HMI. So um, good to hear. And Kelsey, a question came in for you asking, um, who is responsible for organic certification on rented BLM land? And if it's the rancher, um, how much, if at all, is the government agency involved um, in the certification process? Typically, for operations that are, that are grazing on BLM land, what you'll do is you'll go to whatever individual you're working with at BLM, and they can provide that land history to say what's happened to the land in the last three years. Once they provide you with that land history, you sort of manage the certification of that land and working with your certifier. So there's, there's limited interaction from BLM on that process. It's mostly you, the rancher, working with your certifier, and then BLM provides essentially the land history for how they've managed it the past few years. Okay, great, thank you. And then another question came in. Um, someone's wondering what is the rationale for prohibiting antibiotic use um, on an as-needed basis, like not you know something that you give all the time. Sure, that's an interesting question. Um, so the way the NOP has dictated the rules in organic is that you should seek out essentially every option you have with non-synthetic and preventative treatments. And then the caveat is if an animal doesn't respond to a non-synthetic or preventative treatment and still gets sick, you can always take that animal out of certification and treat them with antibiotics. But it was, it was decided in the regulations that it was easier, to, I think, Part of the rationale was it's easier to draw a hot, hard line of no antibiotics and try to manage um, the justification of what occasional use could look like because that could be really varied based on different operations. Um, so if you have a really sick animal, you can always take them out of the program, treat them, and sell them as conventional. Um, but currently, as it stands, there's there's not limited use allowed in the United States. Okay. Hopefully, that answers their question. That's good to know. Um, and there was kind of a follow-up question to that as well. Um, if antibiotics aren't allowed, 
what are some treatments for mastitis or other infections? There's, there's lots of different um, things out there that it kind of varies by operations. There's some pre-formulated products, and then people also sometimes turn to pretty natural substances like, like garlic boluses and things like that. Um, I would highly encourage you to check out. There's some forms of organic producers out there. Um, there's one in, for North, you know, Northeast dairy producers, and there's a couple others that have really great forms that you can take questions to them looking for advice about treatments and and there's a lot of operations out there with a wealth of knowledge that can help you figure out some solutions with what's available in the organic toolbox that's great um and also just to let the audience know we did do a um, webinar last year on dairy health which is a little different than cattle ranching but the veterinarian um, that talked on kind of organic treatments for dairy cattle did address mastitis. So that would be another resource that people could look into. Um, but yeah, the grower or professionals in your area working with the animals are always good people to tap for knowledge um, on how to address things. So um, we had someone write in saying that there's someone also calling in from Costa Rica. So we have an international audience, which is always good to hear. Um, and another question for Kelsey is, for organic beef, what percent of their feed needs to be from grass versus grain? Um, so there's that requirement that your ruminant animals must receive at least 30% of their dry matter from pasture during your grazing season. So at a, at a minimum, you need to have 120 days with those animals grazing at least 30% of their dry matter demand. If you can provide more than that with a longer grazing season or a higher percentage of dry matter, that's great. At the minimum, the bare minimum is 120 days with 30% of their demand coming from pasture. Great. Um, thank you. So um, we had a comment come in from um, uh, another CCOF staff member just wanting to um, make the um, or clarify that organic standards um, don't mandate that you cannot um, withhold treatment to preserve organic status. Um, so just to clarify that. Um, and I think we have one more question coming in for you, Kelsey. Um, would rodent bait stations be allowed on the perimeter of fields, um, provided the stations are approved uh, and, you know, communicated to the certifier? And that they're yeah, also the, locked. The, the key is that you want to communicate what you're doing with your certifier. And as long as livestock don't have access to those state stations, that, that can be a way to manage manage your pest problems. Okay, so um, we're gonna move on to our next presenter, but at the end, we have lots of time for questions, so if you have additional questions for Kelsey, keep writing them in and we'll um, get back to them after the next speaker presents. So Kelsey, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and we'll move on. So it is my pleasure to introduce Joe Morris, co-owner of TO Cattle Company. Um, and he's going to give an overview of the holistic management deci decision-making framework and how he integrates it with organic practices on his ranches. Joe Morris is the fifth generation of his family to steward land and cattle in California. Born and raised in the city of San Francisco, Joe has worked on Buckaroo Cruise in Nevada and California as a lay missioner, community organizer, and social worker with the Catholic Church in Latin America, and has taught high school in Washington, D.C. In 1991, he and his wife, Julie, founded T.O. Cattle Company and have used the holistic management decision-making framework to enhance the health of their community and land, and to produce a living from their work. T.O. Cattle Company leases ranches and markets Morris grass-fed beef to 800 families throughout California. 
Joe has guided over a thousand people across his ranches in the past 25 years, has spoken numerous times on the topics of holistic management, stockmanship, and ranching, and is the founding member of Rancher to Rancher. So Joe, thank you again for being here today, and I will hand the presentation over to you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you too, Kelsey. That was a great, great overview, and I'll try to build on some of that, and there will be a certain amount of um, a repetition or redundancy um, because some of the things that Kelly Kelsey said are things that we've discovered and 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 do. Um, but I think my you know my task today is to try to um, uh, kind of broad broad brushstrokes uh, paint a picture of how Teo Cattle Company and my wife Julie and I and our family have used the principles of holistic management, which is a decision making framework. And when it, within that framework, we have made decisions that have led us to uh, utilize um, organic certification to encourage us to do um, uh, good things on the land and, and also as a, as a means of adding value to the products we produce. Um, early on, it, it occurred to me, in fact, that's why um, I wandered in and out of Buckaroo Cruise and uh, Latin America and, and, uh, and teaching high school, it occurred to me that everything is connected. And I personally couldn't quite figure out how my love of uh, being a cowboy, for example, really was connected with my, my interest as a 23, four-year-old um, in per, you know, living a life that contributed the common good. Um, and it took me a long time to to find um, the framework that I needed. And when I did, it was Alan Savory's uh, work that he'd been working on for a long time. He was a wildlife biologist from Zim from Zimbabwe, and um, and he was talking about using domestic livestock on land to uh, create an antidote to desertification. And so that immediately resonated very deeply with me and that was 1990 when i discovered that and we've been practicing using that framework for making our decisions uh, about people land animals and money for the last 26 years and the first thing that that um uh you know the holistic management is a set of practices and practice one is defining what you manage and that that will be good because um, we have to set the context we have to describe the context for there to be any sense made of the decisions we have made um, you know for example um, if someone says um, I'm going to use a hammer uh, and asks is that a good or bad decision you know the, the right answer would be well I don't know what are you going to use the ha hammer for if you're trying to clean a window uh, it would be a bad decision if you're trying to nail a board it might be a good decision so the context of our decisions is really fundamental to understand um, and holistic management helps us do that so the first thing is to define what we manage and in 1991 when my wife and I uh, started on this adventure um uh, who were uh, what we were managing was me i worked on the i worked in the the, the ranching uh, enterprise we leased 200 acres from my family and we had a forty thousand dollar loan at nine percent so to, that helps give context to where we are today where we have Ju, joe me julie my wife um our daughter and son sarah and jack uh two full-time employees, three part-time employees, five landlords, 800 customer families for our grass-fed beef, 11,000 leased acres, four privately owned ranches, one public land ranch. We have a middle-class income. We grossed, and I'll, you know, I wanna uh, emphasize gross, a million dollars annually for the last several years. Our balance sheet is improving and we do have a plan to retire. So that's, that's where we've, moved in the last 26 years and we've moved as we all do one decision at a time and um, 
and that's why the holistic management decision making framework has been so fundamental to our uh, success. Um, we uh, manage, lease, manage ranches on the central coast of California. Uh, our rainfall is approximately 12 to 18 inches of rain, depending on the ranch and how far we are in from the coast. One ranch is five miles from the coast, one ranch, ranch is 45 miles from the coast. Uh, the landscape is basically uh, oak savanna uh, with winter and cool season annuals and perennial grasses and other shrubs and other perennial plants as well. So um, to a significant degree, our success has been driven by our practice of making decisions using a holistic management decision-making framework. It hasn't made us perfect or brilliant, but it has made us more effective at imagining and producing movement towards our goals. Um, and, and I have not found any downsides to the use of the holistic decision-making framework. Um, there are no cons, only pros. The, the cons come about when we don't use the framework and we tend to get out of balance very quickly if we manage just for people or just for land or just for animals or just for money. And all of us probably have lots of examples of that imbalance. Um, the second practice uh, is to state what you want. What are your deepest desires? In our context and goal, which is for our magnetic north, which draws us to it uh, at TOCC, is we must be peaceful. Fundamentally, that's the, that's the end result that we, we're trying to achieve. We must do work that is meaningful, pleasurable, and profitable. And the lands and communities on which we manage and depend must be thriving and beautiful. So it's fairly simple, but it deeply moves us. Um, one of our important decisions along the way has been to certify our land. Um, and we uh, leased a ranch that was certified already of about 6,500 acres. And we certified our own land of about, well, the other ranches that we leased of about 3,000 acres, um, all with CCOF. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about why and how that's worked out. Um, and we leased, we, 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 met, we chose to certify, decided to certify the land, not the animals, mainly because uh, in 2014, when we were, when we made the decision to certify, we didn't, we had to sell all our animals because of a very intense drought. Um, and uh, therefore, and since then, our ownership of livestock was in flux uh, because of drought, markets, et cetera. Uh, it took us a while to get our landlords on board. Um, everybody has different issues and, and most of them are, are fears. They're afraid. Well, what if, you know, weeds take over uh, the land um, or if they put constraints on us? I won't be able to, for example, um, use an antibiotic or a wormer uh, and maintain um, the organic standards. So, so what do we do about these things? And then there were other livestock owners who had certified livestock. And uh, since we're still operating on borrowed money, it made sense and always has to stock our ranches with uh, other people's livestock. Uh, it, it, and, and we found that if we could, uh, um, if we found landowners or livestock owners with certified livestock, there was a, there was a premium to be had. Um, and then we have dealt with the inspection and documentation of our practices, and they are not as onerous as one might think. Um, all of us, all of our efforts at Theo Cattle Company is, is aiming um, for healthy soil. And um, we think of the earth as a, like an apple. If we remove the skin of an apple, it dries out, it warms up, it begins to break down, oxidize chemically, and uh, and break down even biologically as long as the, long as the water is around. Um, and so we've designed all of our um, all of our uh, management practices to keep the soil surface moist, 
keep the land skin temperature moderate and keep mineral cycling, moving carbon from the atmosphere into the soil through photosynthesis and, uh, and, and, and creating as many opportunities for that, um, that carbon to create life and opportunities for life while it is in our, in our care. Um, as you can see on this slide, there's a dark green sort of triangular area, uh, more or less in the center of the slide. That you know, there's a there's a sharp corner at the top left hand of the slide, and within that fence, in that dark green area, is land that we are managing. It's part of a state park, and this picture was taken by a plane that was flying over. Uh, for the park's purposes, but when I saw it, I thought, wow, that, that really illustrates um, a lot of things going on in that picture that I'm happy about. Um, the green tells us that there's, there's additional water, the plants are still growing, there's more carbon in that, and photosynthesis is happening for a longer period of time, uh, all of which bodes well for life on that landscape. Uh, the, the interesting thing is, is both outside that uh, fence line and within it, basically the tool of grazing is being used. But within the, the line, it's being used in a in a holistic way. Um, and so I like that slide. Um, so what do we have as far as tools um, to accomplish these uh, accomplish these um, goals? Well, holistic management has, uh, uh, you know, a kind of a, bra a parentheses there that has a list of tools, very broad brushstrokes, but those are the tools we basically have uh, to use to accomplish all of our goals. And all of them are used with human creativity and labor. We on Teo Cattle Company use raising and herding. We do use technology and we also use living organisms. In terms of the grazing and herding, uh, I, as you heard from my um, um, introduction, I, I'm a cowboy, I'm a buckaroo. I love the traditions of the vaquero, I love the horses, and I find the herding with horses and dogs and the animals themselves um, a really nice um, way to spend my time and a very effective means to managing land, large landscapes. The animals and I are very dynamic, and the landscape is very dynamic. And so um, it's a great means of, of managing grazing. Downsides to herding, and, and if you've ever tried it, of course, is it requires to do well quite a lot of skill. And so it's, it's not something I can just ask someone to go do. Um, and the good thing about that is I get to do it a lot myself. So, um, so that's 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 the grazing and herding. We also use electric fence, uh, and we do presentations in front of people. This is a rancher to rancher group, which I won't really get into it. But behind, you can see a very sharply outlined uh, square, and um, 450 animals, and a guy on a horse, and a couple of dogs. And within that that square is uh, uh, has an electric fence around it. So we use the electric fence. Uh, it's very helpful uh, and very effective at controlling the animals, which allows us to control their their use of plants and to allow plants to recover, keeping that photosynthesis going uh, as long as possible on our ranches. We also use living organisms. And this is one of the things that we, um, we were drawn to the organic um, uh, organic standards, organic certification, because we, we already believe that we can do things organically um, in ways that uh, create that ecological harmony that, that um, Kelsey mentioned, and that is at the, at the essence of the organic um, philosophy. Um, and we can do that, and we think that is a very powerful means of moving in the direction we want. Um, for example, the option would be to use a wormer if you weren't in the organic program. Um, 
But if you use a worm, if you use a wormer, much of the life that you're managing, the little microbes and the uh, dung beetles, for example, um, bear the brunt of that uh, synthetic uh, application of, of basically poison, and they don't occur on our ranches. And we have, we have, we believe that uh, first of all, our animals do not suffer from high parasite modes because they're managed, and they are. We are selecting when we have bought cows and bulls, we select animals that do well under a low input system. And uh, and we believe that using our intelligence to plan the grazing and to make sure the animals thrive, um, uh, overcome the need to lean on the crutch of uh, a parasiticide. Um, so that's what we do. And when we have those little microbes, the, many of which we don't see, working for us, those are our partners that help build soil aggregates. And those soil aggregates create spaces in the soil that hold water and oxygen and air. And when we have those microbes in that soil structure, we have greater health in the soil, we produce higher density uh, nutritional foods, and uh, we have more water in our soil. And that helps everything, as, as you know. So here is our, our picture of our grazing plan. Uh, it does, and we do use it as part of our organic, um, uh, our OSC, um, and um, and it and it serves us well in that regard, and also as a management tool to to uh, manage land, livestock and, and animals. Um, uh, Bud Williams, who was a great teacher, great livestock handler. Um, had this to say one time. He said, people have a lousy attitude when it comes to working livestock. We want to do this and we want to do that. And he says, this is not going to get us near as far as if we do what we need to do. And I wrote that down and I, I studied it um, ever since. And it seems to me that it applies um, far, far beyond working livestock. Uh, if we go out and we just do what we want to do, we get results that sometimes are far more difficult to handle um, than if we go out than we had at the beginning. If we go out and do what we need to do, generally things improve considerably. But how do we know what we need to do? Well, holistic management uh, is a format, a framework for making decisions. So it's a disciplined approach to the human creative process. It's a checklist, if you will, among other things, of questions to ask ourselves uh, when we're making a decision or thinking about um, one or another action. It helps us avoid ideology, those things that seem like we want to do but really don't help us if in, in when we're uh, in a calmer, smarter um, mode. <clears throat> and it helps us manage as groups which we are often doing in ranching uh, for very complex outcomes. Families, for example, uh, we need personal health, we need economic health, and we need ecological health, and the holistic decision-making framework helps us do that. It honors the fact that nature functions in holes and that everything is connected. Okay, and there's five, the practice five is testing your decisions, and this is where what kind of how we went through the, the process of deciding to uh, certify our lands uh, as organic. Um, so the first question is, what's the root cause? If you're dealing with a problem, this is the first question that you want to ask yourself. In this case, we weren't really working with a problem uh, as such, a weed problem, for example, or a, a, you know a bankruptcy problem or something like that. Uh, we were so it didn't strictly apply to this particular decision. So we, we moved on. We were doing our financial planning. And so there's, in, when you're doing uh, financial planning, you, you, you think about several kinds of weak links. And uh, the financial weak link, um, or the financial weak link test is a, is a test where you can, you know, you think about, okay, I have animals, grass, uh, and money at the end. And you're always trading these things. You have 
either money or you buy animals and you have less money but more animals or you rent ground and you have more grass you know in other words you're trading these things there's always a weakest link in your animal enterprise your grazing enterprise for example if you have lots of grass and you're converting all the solar energy into grass but too few animals your weak link is converting that grass into an animal that you can then market um, in 2014, we were working on financial planning, and the financial weak link of our contract grazing enterprise was our marketing link. Uh, we had a contract grazing enterprise, but we only were able to use um, conventional animals. What could we do, we asked, to improve the dollars received for the same service or product? And we decided that uh, organic certification would allow us to charge a 30% premium per pound of gain. Uh, we knew that the demand for grass-fed beef has been growing every year. Uh, it's one of the hottest um, sectors of the food industry. Um, and that organic food sales increase by double digits annually. And so it's another growth um, aspect of the, of the food industry. And all, all those things helped us understand that if we were going to compare um, the options of certifying or not certifying um, certifying had a lot of a lot of upsides to it but we had landlords that said well what about weeds if we have weeds we can't use herbicides and so we asked again going back to the holistic framework and said can we tap into the power of natural systems can we use organic means that will save us money and create biodiversity and we found that we we could um, we could use animals to eat the weeds we could use human creativity to teach animals to eat weeds uh, and we could use our grazing planning to create a more biologically rich landscape but what about parasiticides well i think i addressed that a little bit earlier if anybody has further questions we can we can um, talk about that as well. Um, in essence, our, our, our conclusion was that the action A, certifying organic, would produce, help us produce peace, more profit, soil health, and ecosystem function. And so we decided ultimately to go that direction. Um, when we're working with nature, we're more peaceful. Um, we could reduce costs by using more creativity. Uh, we could use grazing, we could use living organisms to improve soil health and create more and faster photosynthesis on our land. Okay, gross profit analysis is, is another test of, within the framework. <clears throat> and, it, and basically it was, um, does our, contract raising enterprise produce more gross income um, or a, a better gross profit, gross margin than a conventional. And we found it did. Okay, always asking at the end, are we headed toward or away after making this decision from our future vision? And organic certification uh, clearly enhanced our marketing cachet and we were direct marketing. So that was important to us. It added to our customer base, helping us be more stable economically. It enhanced our credibility. We had third-party certification by CCOF. It added another means to profitability. We could no longer, we didn't only have to have conventional cattle, we could have uh, a cattle uh, that were certified as well. And encouraged us to find biological and creative solutions to biological problems. Does the decision feeling, feel right? It does, based on our culture, certified, certified organic, uh, organic certification of the land feels like the right decision to make. And then we monitor for what, how we're doing. What, how is that decision affecting our, our, our family, our, our land, our animals? Uh, Peter Donovan has helped us, and he is he founded the Soil Carbon Coalition with some other uh, people. And he says monitoring is the best practice. We often hear about 
lots of best practices. But monitoring, I think, is consistent with Bud Williams's observation that we need to do what we need to do and not merely what we want to do. And monitoring helps us understand that. We've been monitoring uh, our soil carbon on our land and did this. We started in 2011. That was this, this, a year before a very serious drought. In 2015, the drought had been going on for four years and we monitored uh, a second time. And uh, at least on one transect, on some transects, there was no change. And I was actually fairly happy with that given the drought conditions. But on one ranch where there was more animals, bigger herds, more management, we had increases in soil carbon down to um, 18 inches below the surface of the soil. And with that, uh, we'll kind of wrap up and and um, answer questions if, if people have them. Great. Thank you very much. That was a really nice overview of holistic management and kind of how it applied to your decision-making process on whether to certify organic or not. So thank you again um, for your presentation. And um, we've had a number of questions come in for you. But before I get to that, I just wanted to clarify something. I had read something incorrectly uh, earlier in the webinar. So I just wanted to clarify that the organic standards mandate that you have to treat your animals so that you cannot withhold treatments to preserve your status. So I wanted to make sure that was clear. Um, so we're going to take some questions for Joe now and then also in a little bit open it up to um, both Kelsey and as a reminder, we have Kathy Harris online too that has can speak to holistic management as well. So Joe, someone was wondering, um, how do you select and choose your most profitable animals? How do we select and choose our most profitable animals? Um, you know, I'm not sure we we select at that uh, granular of a level. Um, uh, I guess I would have a sense of that. If you know, on, in our cow and calf herd, um, there were cows that were favorites. <laughs> And they consistently stayed fat, produced a nice calf, and um, you know, and that, and, and under our conditions, that implies a high gross profit uh, for that animal. Um, so through observation is how we would do that. And you know, when you spend a lot of time with your animals, that's how you know. We we look more um, in terms of the gross profit analysis. We look at our our enterprises. Because uh, there may be one or other animal that that um, may be profitable, but as an enterprise, that enterprise may not be as profitable as other enterprises. Um, for example, we, you know, we decided to sell our cows and calves not because they weren't good cows and calves, but because that enterprise was going to fail terribly if we had to a bring in a to feed them uh or b um even worse we didn't bring in hay to feed them there was no grass that enterprise needed to go somewhere else and we could uh, analyze that based on uh the economics of the marketplace and uh and the other considerations of that in that decision great thank you um, and we had another question come in um, asking, you know, where they can find more information about the holistic management framework. So, um, Kathy, I just wanted to invite you to um, jump online, and um, I know you have some resources that are available for folks, but also if there's anything you wanted to add to Joe's presentation or kind of bring to the forefront about the holistic management, um, feel free to do that as well. Thanks. Uh, this is Kathy Harris, uh, Program Director for HMI, and uh, we are a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to do education in holistic management. Um, so our website is a great place to start. Um, we have uh, a special offer for attendees of the webinar. Uh, there's a coupon code there for 15% off any of our grazing planning worksheets. and uh, we also have a whole slew of classes uh, that we offer 
both online and uh, place-based, one-day field days and more in-depth workshops. Uh, some of those are FSA approved courses, and we do have scholarships available if, if that's uh, something of interest. Um, and I just want to say thank you again to Joe for sharing all of his great experience with holistic management and, and the impact that it has had on his operation. Um, the website there is down at the bottom, holisticmanagement.org. And we have a number of publications that have a lot of great information. Every other month, our In Practice Journal has really in-depth case studies, real-life examples, uh, articles of ranchers and farmers, people who are practicing holistic management and really uh, changing their lives, their, uh, improving their land, uh, impacting their whole communities in, in very positive ways. So I really encourage you. Um, if you would like a free subscription to that, um, if you'll just uh, email or go online and, and um, send an email to our uh, info at holisticmanagement.org, uh, we can get you signed up for that. Uh, we also have a, an e-letter that it's, um, has a lot of special offers and lets you know about programs, educational programs we have coming up. And we do a, a blog almost every day. There's a new article on something. So um, the free downloads also, uh, in particular, uh, ones that might be of interest to this crowd would be the Holistic Grazing Planning Manual. Uh, you can, can download that and uh, find a, a whole lot of information at the website. So if anyone has specific questions, you can uh, ask them now or, or email me later. I see I don't have my email address on there, but I think Megan was going to put that uh, either in some follow-up information to the webinar or whatever. Yeah, so. no, that's, that's correct. Um, thanks for sharing all that information. And we will send out a link to the website and Kathy's email to all um, participants who are online today. So if you want to follow up that way, um, that what works as well. Um, so Joe, we have another question for you. What are your thoughts about alternative um, or proposed certifications like holistically managed or grown using regenerative organic practices? Um, so kind of this idea of other labels for um, communicating with customers how you're, um, you know, uh, managing your cattle and sort of your values? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think that, I think they're great. Um, whether or not they're worth it is something to consider. I mean, I, you know, trying to have your customers understand your values is, is really uh, important. Um, but they're not all certifications are equal you know they they don't all have the same uh as i used in my talk cachet you know they're not they don't ccof for example and organic in general is very well known um and it and it has you know through marketing and actual practices um it resonates with people very deeply um if you are certified for regenerative agriculture, that's great, and I, I'm I'm really happy about that. I'm not sure how many. Um, I, I I don't know the specific value, and so uh, of these of these different things. So if you if you choose to do that, um, you know what I would say, given my background in holistic management, is to monitor that decision. You know, try to figure out what's going to tell you that making that decision has improved your life or has not. Um, so that, that's, that's it. I, you know, I think it's great. Um, and it also makes a difference and it has made a difference to us. Um, you know, how much distance there is between you and your customers. If your customers are picking your, if they know you, if they can come to your ranch, if they um, can ask you questions and if, you know, and if you're a believable person, 
um, you probably don't need too many uh, certifications. But if you're going to be in a in a larger marketplace where there's more distance between you and your customer, your customer is going to look for guidance and certifiers certification at that point are can be very valuable not all certifications are as valuable as others so it, it anyway those are some thoughts great uh, thank you very much um, and that um, again kind of how to use the, the holistic management framework to think about those decisions is really helpful um, and Kelsey I also kind of wanted to forward the question on to you as well as kind of what are your thoughts about um, alternative certifications other than organic? Uh, let's see. Kelsey, are you there? Um, we'll move on to the next question and then uh, loop back around to that. So, um, Joe, was there a slaughterhouse that was certified organic in your area when you started the process of getting certified? Um, you know, <clears throat> uh, there was when we started, um, but that, and there, there, I think there, there still are. Uh, slaughterhouses in California um, are very, very, in, in very short supply. Uh, and the, I only know of one. There may be others that are certified organic. Uh, Kelsey or or you, Megan, would know better than I probably. Um, and since since the animals we actually own and market as Morris grass fed are not certified organic, um, I I have I don't I don't know as well as you know others might. Okay. Thanks. Um, and uh, Kelsey, if you want to jump in on both the um, slaughtering facility question and the alternative uh, certification question as well. Sure. Um, so I was just echoing the same things that Joe, Joe had said. Uh, you kind of want to know the value of what certifications you're going to undertake and what that means for your marketing. As, as kind of a reminder, in order to use the term organic, you'll have to be certified because it is essentially regulated by, by the National Organic Program. Um, but in terms of other certifications, if, if there's value to your customers in conveying information and it's a certification that's, that's backed up by, by a vi viable certification process, um, then it may be something you want to explore. If you're direct marketing and can explain directly to your customers and have them coming to your farm, maybe third-party certifications don't have quite as much power. Uh, the beauty of organic is that it's, it's fairly well known by a large amount of consumers and it's fairly sought after and there's a growing demand for organic. And so that's why a lot of producers elect to choose organic right now. Um, going way back to Joe, he had a question about how to select your most profitable animals. I just wanted to throw out there as well that if you're looking into selection and how to best choose animals for your um, operation. Another sort of interesting read, if you're looking for further reading, is the Lassiter philosophy on cattle raising. Um, just from like a personal standpoint, I thought it was a really interesting read and can be very helpful in that selection process. And then jumping to the last question about slaughter, operations do run into issues about finding slaughter facilities that are certified organic. The number of certified facilities is growing. But that could be another thing that maybe you ask around people in your area, what um, slaughter facility they use. Some that come to mind just off the top of my head, of course, this isn't comprehensive and this is just in California, but um, people are using Del Campo in Northern California. There's Crescent Valley Meat. Um, I believe Redwood is certified. There are operations that are meeting the exemption for on site poultry processing that you could process on farm if you're raising. Uh, a number of poultry that falls under that exemption. So there's there are places to find that can cut and wrap and kill your animals that are certified. You just might have to do a little bit of homework um, on which ones those are. Unfortunately, a lot of slaughter facilities have a ton of paperwork already, and so some of them aren't ready to take on an additional certification when they have more demand than they know what to do with at this time. That being said, we have had a number of slaughter facilities get certified in the last few years, and so that availability is is growing over time as the demand for organic grows. 
which is encouraging. Great, thank you. Um, and just to let everybody know that we'll send out um, Kelsey's reading recommendations if you didn't have time to jot them down. Um, and Kelsey, we have another question for you. Um, are there guidelines or restrictions for which livestock washes can be used in order to be certified organic? Livestock washes, are we talking about like soap? Did I hear that right? Yeah, livestock washes. Yeah, um, there are certain soap products that are approved. Um, there are certain sanitizers as well that I'm not sure if you're, there's lots of washes that we could be talking about in terms of if we want to wash a live animal to clean them. There are some certain soaps. If you're talking about carcass washes at the slaughter facility, there's some of those as well. Um, sort of the always the takeaway is if, if you're looking for a material, I would highly encourage you to reach out to a certifier and say, this is the product and these are the ingredients. Can you tell me if that's an option in organic? And most certifiers are happy to look into those materials and review them for you. And we can come up with some options of what you could use. Great, um, thanks Kelsey. And Joe, we have one more question for you. Are there any tips you have for integrating record keeping in your day-to-day -day activities to make it less burdensome or just kind of more part of your process? Oh, um, well, I, I think that uh, <clears throat> That's, I'm not the best, <laughs> to be honest. Um, there, there are, uh, you know, like Kathy mentioned the um, the HMI grazing program, um, and I think that that's a digital program and and can be. I, I, you know, I'm pretty old school, so I've used uh, the paper program for a long time, and that's been very helpful. And I, you know, I just keep notes on my calendar and on my phone. Um, but the, I think HMI has a, a, an electronic or digital uh, grazing program, which which I've seen, and it, I think it 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 probably would would be um, in some ways considerably easier to to you know to maintain, especially if you have to change it, which is part of the process. Um, other other records, you know. Um, I don't, we, you know, we keep we keep records for, um, you know, our the organic certification. So we, you know, when we're buying things and 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 uh, you know products to use and so forth. But um, we we're not. I don't. I don't have any. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't try to keep too many records because I don't find a lot of records are worth it. Um, I think there are certain records that you need to keep. Um, and, and a lot of those are accomplished during the, the planning process itself, um, the financial planning and uh, and uh, grazing planning. Um, so anyway, there there it is. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's good. And um, one of the things we often hear people recommend as well is that work, do what works for your operation. And so I think that's very good. You know you know what records you need to keep and what works for you. Um, and in the past, we um, did a webinar on record keeping and we had a really big operation that did everything by paper and that worked for them. And we've had other operations that are you know, just all small and starting up and they do everything online. So it's really just kind of what works for you. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up. Um, again, if you have any final questions that you didn't have time to answer here today, feel free to touch base with me or Kathy and we'll follow up with you. We'll have contact information at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. So thank you again to Kelsey and Joe for taking time out of your busy schedules to present here today. It's been very useful information and we appreciate the time. And just a couple, oh, yes, thanks. Um, like HMI, CCOF has a wealth of resources on their uh, website. So go to our website and check that out. We also, our summer magazine had a whole article on the organic livestock regulations. So if you just want to find out more about them, kind of where they're going, that's a good place to look. 
The ATRA website is a great resource for sustainable livestock production. Um, and they also have this 1-800 hotline that you can call with questions and they'll answer your question. And if they don't have an answer for you, they'll do research, which is, I think, one of the best kept secrets out there. So do check that out. Uh, CCOF has some upcoming webinars this fall, so check out our events page. We'll have a soil health webinar in August, a um, webinar on the Food Safety Modernization Act, and that's more for produce, uh, for produce growers and agricultural professionals that work with them. And um, here in California, um, cannabis, sort of, or cannabis is now legal to be grown. So we've been getting a lot of questions about whether we can certify it or not, which we can't, but if you want to kind of find out why not, join us in October. Um, as Kelsey mentioned, we are one of many organic certifiers out there. There's about 50 certifiers that are accredited to certify to the USDA uh, National Organic Standard. The Agricultural Marketing Service website is a great place to find out more about the different options out there. And we always encourage people to do your homework, pick the certifier that works best for you. If you're interested in certification with CCOF, um, please give us a call. Our new applicant liaison, Jane Wade, will be more than happy to answer any of your questions. And she has a huge wealth of knowledge. So shoot her an email or give her a phone call if you have any questions about organic certification. And thank you. We hope you found the presentation informative. And please fill out the evaluation form when you shut up, close out of the webinar. It'll pop up. And it helps us develop and improve our educational offerings. And again, please feel free to follow up. We love hearing from folks. And if you have any questions we can't answer, we're more than happy to put you in contact with someone who can. So thank you again, and have a great afternoon.